there are certain things that when you hear them, you know that they are 100% fact. Final Fantasy VII is the greatest video game that has ever been made. Budweiser is the worst beer that you could possibly ever put to your lips. The 1996 Atlanta Braves starting pitching rotation. The greatest in MLB history. The Iconics. Two of the worst professional wrestlers on the planet. Triple H. Reportedly the most frustrated person in the WWE. Now, I didn't need a report to know that as being fact. I did. I did. And Triple H goes on a random interview or he'll mention Vince McMahon in passing, really being a good son-in-law, really being a good soldier in the WWE Army. Oh, Vince is a genius. Oh, nobody works as hard as Vince McMahon. Oh, Vince watches NXT. Oh, Vince cares about NXT. Blah, 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 blah. People, it all starts at the top. When you have upper management feeling the way Triple H is feeling, and people underneath him see that and feel his frustrations, of course they're going to feel the same way. You have to lead by example. No matter how hard it is for Triple H to lead by example, I'm sure everything that is being said on social media, the ratings in the toilets, the creative mess that is WWE, the NXT talents that have been brought up and ultimately wasted after Triple H has done so much to help them and guide them to this point, there's only so much that that man can take. And I'm sure it is incredibly difficult to come to work every Monday and Tuesday and feel like you're not even wanted there. As if your opinion doesn't matter. I didn't need any report to see this. I know. I know. I didn't even need to read a report on Triple H. You could read the reports about Sasha Banks. You could read the reports about every fucking person that has asked for their release from the WWE. You can just get a sense of it with AEW coming into the game. Everybody wants to defect to AEW. Why is that? If you're happy with your current position at your current employer, if you are happy about what is going on there, AEW is a non-factor. Why would you want to go play for another team if your team is winning all the games. WWE is on a massive losing streak, and everybody in that company knows it, and one of the head coaches knows it in Triple H. Now, I'm going to take this from Solomon Monster because I loved this analogy. He recently polled his fans on Twitter, and I don't know what week it was, but it was recent, within the last couple of weeks. He put a poll out on Twitter, and he mentioned, what did you think about Monday Night Raw? It had something along the lines of 93% thumbs down, and only 7% thumbs up. Now, he made a comparison from that poll to what I'm about to tell you now. The head coach has won seven games, and he lost 93 games. If you are a team, and you are an owner of a team, and you see that your manager is losing seven games, or winning seven games, rather, and losing 93, what is going to be your first reaction to seeing a statistic like that? Seven wins and 93 losses? Here's your pink slip. Get the fuck out of here. I wish the players would rally around Triple H and say something to this fucking senile old man who is on the biggest losing streak in WWE. He's the head coach, isn't he? He's the man in charge. He's the man making all the decisions. He's the one setting up the starting lineup every Monday and Tuesday night. 
But the people that he's putting out there and the ideas that are going into these plays that you see on Monday and Tuesday night are just not working. So you need somebody else in there. You got to get somebody in there with fresh ideas. You got to get somebody else in there who's younger and more in tune with what's going on instead of living in your own fucking bubble where nothing is allowed to seep through. Or that, you just don't care. Triple H is reportedly frustrated. The most frustrated person in all of WWE. Now, with this report, Triple H, the last couple of weeks, has acknowledged the frustration from fans on social media. There were a couple of tweets in which he accidentally, quote-unquote, liked. You don't accidentally like a tweet that is that direct aimed at WWE and Vince McMahon. You don't. You don't put your phone in your pocket and ass like a fucking tweet by accident. Like, you ass dial your your best friend and you're waiting there, hello, bro, what's going on? Are you okay? And you hear nothing but fucking rustling around and you hear distant talking in the background and then you end up hanging up after two minutes knowing that he ass dialed you by accident. You don't do that. That's not possible on Twitter. Now, in the last week, Triple H, like I said, seemed to acknowledge the fans, and he knows change is needed, but there's not much he can do until Vince McMahon decides to step aside. Triple H recently liked and then unliked two fan tweets in the last couple of weeks. Some of the unusual stories that are coming out uh, have been confirmed on Wade Keller's pro wrestling post show when a close friend of three WWE creative writers called into a show after Monday Night Raw. It is very clear that the buck stops with Vince McMahon. All decisions are final with Vince McMahon. And it doesn't look like real change is coming anytime soon, even though the man himself came out on Monday Night Raw in December and said change was coming and none of what he said then is happening now and we are already getting into the summer months. Six months have passed, seven months have passed since that very day in the middle of that ring where I clearly remember Vince, Stephanie, Triple H, and Shane all in the ring promising something that ultimately was erased. It fell on deaf ears. They got us excited because they knew they needed to make an announcement. And of course, Vince McMahon, in typical Vince McMahon fashion, shows us how much he hates us. How much our opinion doesn't matter because he knows that us, the diehards, are going to end up watching week to week to week to week anyway. Now, here are some of the things that this close friend of the three WWE creative writers said on the Wade Keller PW Torch podcast. This is a long list, folks, so grab a beverage. You want to pause the video right here? There's going to be a long list of shit that is going to make you wonder why you're even still watching the fucking product. A long list of things that are going to make you realize why AEW is so fucking important. WWE's problems are not the fault of the writers. No one should rip on WWE creative. They have some of the most brilliant, unbelievable, cool ideas that I've ever heard. He was told, we're writing for an audience of one and never forget that. And if not, you're out of here. That guy, Mr. Callahan, Ryan Callahan, I believe his name was. He was part of WWE Creative on Monday Night Raw. He was part of the head team from Monday Night Raw with Raj Singh, Mr. Kapoor, right? What happened? They fired him. Why did they fire him? Because the report cited that he was so upset that his ideas were not even being considered because Mr. Kapoor needs to write for one man. See, Mr. Kapoor is a fucking zombie in the WWE landscape. He is so brainwashed 
that all he knows is to write for Vince McMahon. Meanwhile, Mr. Callahan, who was fired because he didn't play well with others, didn't listen to Mr. Kapoor, and he didn't want to write for an audience of one anymore because he knows whatever the fuck is going on is not working. I would be pissed too. I would get up and say something. My ideas are better than what you're writing. You're writing not because of you. You're writing because Vince McMahon's gonna like it. So they fired him. They fired him. How terrible is that? How terrible is this just based off that? Where the morale is already low. Especially with creative. How terrible is that knowing that you have a, a job where your job is to be creative and you can't be creative because everything's shot down. Oh, Vince is not going to like it. Oh, Vince is not going to approve that. Oh, that's too good for us. Vince is going to go and change it anyway. Who wants a job like that? Really, who wants a job like that? This is why I laugh. People actually come to me and show me online listings of WWE creative having an open position. Why the fuck would I want to subject myself to that? Do you really want me to hang myself? Seriously. There have been reports that people in creative are seen crying because they're so stressed out. I would not want to be in an environment or have a job such as that where I'm fucking so stressed that I want to fucking cry in front of everybody. That was Gail Kim. Gail Kim. TNA Knockout. Hall of Famer. Gail Kim mentioned that when she was there, she seen creative writers fucking crying their eyes out because they were so stressed. Meanwhile, Mr. Callahan had God knows what of an idea. Let go. Fired. There you go. The most frustrated person in the back every single night is Triple H. He'll always take, especially the NXT guys, under his wing. It looks like he's consoling them. It looks so much like he was the most frustrated person in the building every single night. I believe that to the fucking high heavens. I am sure that is 100% factual. No matter what you think about the NXT guys, oh, they're vanilla midgets, oh, this gimmick is only an NXT gimmick, it's never gonna get over. That doesn't mean that it won't get over on the main roster because you think Vince is not gonna like it. Vince doesn't give it a chance. Vince doesn't give it a chance. Tyler Breeze, he was given three weeks on the main roster with his gimmick that we seen in NXT. What happened after that? They turned him into a fucking semi-stripper, right? Tyler Breeze looked like somebody that would pop out of a fucking cake at a bachelorette party in a police outfit, stripping in front of a bunch of 50-year-old hags. That's exactly what he looked like. Fandango, too! Meanwhile, they paired them together because... They didn't have anything creatively for them, but underneath all that fucking garbage of the gimmick which they made work, they were entertaining, and they were great wrestlers at that! Vince McMahon found nothing but comedy in Tyler Breeze. Meanwhile, back in the day, we had the model Rick Martel. You know, Prince Pretty was a take on the model Rick Martel, who was one of my favorite characters in WWE growing up. I mean, how, how can't you like and admire the fucking mo The model had charisma for days. You know? He was a take on the model Rick Martel. He was a take on Shawn Michaels. He was a take on Mr. Perfect. I, I don't understand. Yet we have the Velveteen Dream, who's pretty much Prince Pretty to the fucking 10th degree. What do you think's gonna happen to the Velveteen Dream? When he gets called up to the main roster, are they going to look at him any differently? Are they going to look at his skin color and say, oh, well, he's only got a certain ceiling, so he can't really be a WWE champion? Meanwhile, we all know Patrick Clark is a WWE champion. How terrible is that? Honestly, how terrible is that? Ricochet and the Ascension... And Aleister Black and Heavy Machinery. God, I'm pretty sure I could envision it now, man. I could see him consoling EC3 in the back. And what they've done to EC3 is absolutely fucking god-awful. God-awful. I, 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 I would love to be a fly on the wall when Triple H is down with his NXT guys. 
what they're saying to him. Why did you do this to me? I want to go back home. I want to be at full sale. I'll take the pay cut. I want to be booked creatively. I don't think I'd ever make it up here after what I've seen and what I've heard and what I've just been around. God knows what Triple H is telling them. What could he possibly tell them? Don't worry, things are going to get better. You know how many times... You know how many times you could tell that to somebody over and over and over and over again? And, and, and that person knows that when they hear that, it's nothing but a lame fucking excuse. Just like the excuse of, oh, don't worry, you'll get over it if you're going through a breakup. Or you never know what the future holds. God, I fucking hate that. God, I fucking hate when people tell me that. You never know what the future holds. That is nothing more than an excuse and a tryhard one at that for the person who's telling you that to try and console you, but it never works out. And you know, in the end, whatever you're fearing most is going to fucking happen. Because I've been there. Fucking ridiculous. I know exactly what every one of these fucking people is feeling. Triple H, not only with consoling the NXT guys, Triple H reportedly doesn't even speak to Vince McMahon as often as people think, this guy is the son-in-law of the boss. The, the, Triple H is married to Stephanie McMahon. How many kids he's got? Three, four kids? How do you think Triple H feels knowing that he doesn't speak to Vince McMahon or isn't allowed to or can't get his attention because Vince McMahon is off ruining yet another fucking program on a weekly basis? How do you think Triple H feels that the only time he sits down with Vince McMahon is at a family gathering during the holidays, whether it be Christmas or Thanksgiving, Easter, 4th of July, right? Knowing that Vince McMahon, the only time he speaks to Triple H is when he's visiting his grandsons. I, I, I don't believe this. I, I really don't understand how you could work in the same company and be the fucking COO of the company, running NXT, running NXT UK, running 205 Live. Everything that is on those shows is being paid for and signed off on by Vince McMahon, and you don't speak to the boss? I, I don't understand that. I, I really don't understand that. Triple H is said to be frustrated. Yes, we get it. With the company's current creative direction... But Fightful and Sean Ross Sapp reports, I'm told Triple H doesn't even speak to Vince McMahon as much as one would think. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter also noted this, that Triple H picks his spots to talk with Vince, but never does it in front of anybody. I find that to be incredibly interesting. He never does it in front of anybody. Now, why is that? Why is that? My only assumption with that is, is if... Triple H is seen talking to Vince McMahon amongst everybody. I, I feel like it, it could ruffle a few feathers and it might give hope to those people that are watching. Or maybe, maybe the people on Vince McMahon's side loathe Triple H so much that anything that Triple H says is never going to get through because you got so many fucking yes men on Vince McMahon's side that anything Triple H says, which is probably more logical than anything that these fucking people can come up with, is going to be shot down. So we'd rather talk to Vince McMahon in private away from everybody else. That's probably the main reason why he does it in public and picks his spots, or, or in private rather, and picks his spots. I don't know why. I really don't know why, how this guy's working for the fucking company as the COO and, and, and your boss. You, you don't speak to your boss. What type of healthy work environment is that? That's not normal. That is not normal. Now, Triple H wasn't even informed, as we all know, about Gargano, Champa, Ricochet, Aleister Black being called up on the main roster. This goes back to Vince McMahon not even letting Triple H know about calling those people up. He did it behind Triple H's back. There was zero communication. And if Triple H, I mentioned this and went off, if Triple H had been informed, he would have never let Champa compete on the main roster, knowing that the man was due to have neck surgery after takeover New York. And we still would have gotten Gargano and Champa completed. Now we're left hanging with a storyline that Vince McMahon ultimately fucking killed for no reason. And we got a great match out of it. I'm not really complaining. I'm just saying 
The simple basis of it is that storylines have been tarnished and damaged because of Vince McMahon's recklessness. All because he didn't want to communicate with Triple H. When Vince wants, Vince wants and gets. That's not the mentality a boss should have. Give me a fucking break. Especially with your own fucking family. The wild card rule. I'm not surprised by this at all. The wild card rule was not in the script on the morning of the show. Really now. So this goes back to Meltzer the week before saying that, oh, WWE gets the ratings for Raw on Tuesday. They get the ratings for SmackDown on Wednesday. And Vince McMahon is in the office on Thursday coming up with a game plan to fix whatever's wrong with the ratings and attack Monday show. Really now. Really now. This goes to show you that all the reports about Raw being chaotic and Raw's script being finalized five minutes before the show goes on the air is absolutely 100% true. The wild card rule was not in the script on the morning of the fucking show. So when the fuck was it incorporated in the goddamn show? Not only that, when did you tell the people on SmackDown Live that they had to be on Monday Night Raw? Chaotic. That's a man who doesn't know what the fuck he is doing. Yet he calls himself a genius. A genius, a genius would have come come up with and devised a plan that was weeks in advance. You're going to plan it out and execute it perfectly. A genius does not do something on the spur of the moment and call it a brilliant plan. I'm sorry. The wild card rule has so many flaws in it, still to this day. Three weeks after it has been instituted... And it hasn't done a goddamn fucking thing. Everything feels even more so irrelevant and unimportant. Logic gaps. Nobody knows who is making these decisions. How they're basing these decisions. Why these people are showing up on the shows. They don't really factor into anything but getting star power on the shows. And you think they're stars. Meanwhile, you buried everybody on the fucking roster. So no matter who you put on Raw and SmackDown, it's not going to generate any fucking interest. Because you've already fucking conditioned your people and the audience to not give a shit. Lingering damage after years and years of abuse. And you all of a sudden think that the wild card rule is going to change... And people's mentality and perception of these stars are going to change because they're jumping ship from Raw to, Raw to SmackDown. I never heard of such stupidity in my entire life. It's not working. It's not working. You either go all in with the brand split or you fucking get rid of it. This is nothing more than a fucking excuse to WWE and they're taking that and sp- Spawning it off on their audience. Yeah, well, the brand's supposed to failure, but we're doing this now to try and correct the mistakes that we've done over the last five years. Not working. Not working. But who is WWE? A company that will not ever admit their failures. The superstar shakeup changed week to week, and it didn't pan out how it originally was laid out for months prior. Oh, well, look at that. Something was laid out in advance. Wow. Wow. Everything changed because Vince just decided to change it. So everybody had months of planning with the superstar shakeup, and when things were about to be executed, Vince just changed everything. This is somebody you want to work for? Is this someone, by the sounds of it, who should be running a fucking multi-billion dollar company creatively? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. He talked about the turnover with so many backstage people quitting or being fired. Not a surprise there. It's not a difficult scene to picture as to why these people want to quit or get fired. AEW's on the horizon with Double or Nothing next weekend. It's here, folks. It's here. And based off that one show and the excitement that that show is going to bring in, you're going to see more people wanting to quit, wanting to walk out, and wanting to purposely get fired. There were reports that people in the WWE were willing to to purposely fail their drug tests just to get out of there. Now that's a fucking shame that you would be willing to fail a drug test over and over and over again just for the sake of getting out of the company. And WWE had to, you know, buckle down and realize, well, You know, this person hasn't had a violation yet. All of a sudden, we're starting to see a trend here. No. No. 
They, they put a stop to that immediately. SmackDown and Raw writing teams are the same for both shows. They used to be separate, but that changed recently after the shakeup. I, I don't think that's true at all. They used to be separate, but that changed after the shakeup. No wonder SmackDown is so fucking terrible. You got the people on Monday Night Raw writing for SmackDown. I don't want anybody on Monday Night Raw handling the people on SmackDown. It's the same fucking show. There's nothing different about SmackDown Live. Meanwhile, with the brand split, we were promised, ideally, to have separate rosters. Different feel on Tuesday night, different feel on Monday. SmackDown had the different camera angles that they were doing. SmackDown was more wrestling-focused. SmackDown was more storyline-driven. Now SmackDown Live is nothing but Raw 2.0. I don't know if I'm watching Raw on Tuesday or Raw on Monday. How is that a good thing? How? And I don't even need to tell you about 2016. I know back then when the brand split happened, when SmackDown got the shaft in the brand split, I know for a fact Ryan Ward was was writing those shows. I know for a fact everything was separate. For a couple of months, then Jinder Mahal became the WWE champion. Talking Smack got canceled. Jinder Mahal took the WWE title. Who do you think injected their poison into that show? The old man. Raw and SmackDown writing teams need to be different. Different. You got 30 writers. You don't need 30 writers to write fucking one show. Split the fucking teams up. Half on Raw, half on SmackDown. Not like their ideas are getting used anyway. Plus the travel. You gonna travel for Raw? Normally you had Tuesday off. Now you gotta travel for Raw and SmackDown. To basically sit there and do nothing. Oh, I pitched this idea. Oh, it was changed at 7.59. The fuck am I here for? The caller emphasized... This guy didn't leave a name, by the way. The caller emphasized that the problems in WWE are not creative's fault... And Vince McMahon is the only person who deserves all of the blame. I mentioned this on SmackDown Live in a heated 20-minute rant to open that podcast. I will no longer blame WWE Creative. I know Mr. Kapoor is a Vince McMahon dick licker, so he doesn't get a buy. Everybody that's on the right hand of the devil, I fucking hate. Because they know that what they're doing is wrong, yet they continue to do it anyway. These people have no balls. Speak up to Vince McMahon. Say something. Hey, it's not going to work. Hey, we shouldn't be doing this. Hey, we should be pushing this guy. Hey, this guy's in-ring work has been stellar for the last six months. Why can't we push him? Oh, we don't speak English. Oh, he's not over with the fans. Oh, he doesn't sell enough merchandise. But Vince, he's got the qualities that you're looking for in, in, a, in a number one guy. Oh, I don't care. I do what I want. Where's Roman Reigns? Put him on TV six more fucking times in one night. I am never going to blame WWE creative ever again. It's all Vince McMahon. This entire fucking dialogue goes over that. So I apologize to everybody on WWE creative. And if anybody's listening to me, I mentioned this on Tuesday. I apologize for all the nasty and derogatory things I've said about you guys. Road Dog and everybody else involved. With the creative side of things. There's a reason why Road Dog is not there. Because he was stressed the fuck out. A WWE lifer in the Road Dog, A fucking Hall of Famer. Had enough. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it anymore. And I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Who knows what Road Dog's ideas were. Who knows how many of Road Dog's ideas actually made it on the show. And Road Dog, like a good little soldier... Had to abide by company policy. Oh, I can't say anything derogatory on social media. So he is in the line of fire and he's got to be and act a certain way to the audience on social media, which throws him into a bad light. We criticize him because we know him as being part of creative and he's taking the bullet, which Vince McMahon should be taking. I apologize to everybody in creative. Because, honestly, it's so logical. There's no fucking way that a wrestling company that houses 30 creative writers, there's no fucking way that a company with that much brain power can produce such garbage fucking television. There's no way. There's not one, there's not one thing. 
There's not one thing that those guys have done that I guarantee you made the fucking program. How could it? These shows have no substance. They are completely lifeless. They're dead. They have no soul. There's no passion in any of these shows. You mean to tell me those shows are written by 30 fucking creative writers? How lifeless these shows are? Dead. Dead. That's one man. These shows mimic exactly what Vince McMahon looks like. A fucking lifeless zombie. Split the fucking teams up and get some motivation underneath all of them. It's all Vince McMahon's fault. Vince wants suggestions from everybody, but it never gets on TV. 99 out of 100 times, the creative team would come up with an idea and Vince won't use it. You mean to tell me that the WWE model right now, the WWE quality of things on television is right? Why do you even pay these people? Why are you paying these people when you could be paying another fucking talent? You could be paying somebody else, right? I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't really get it. 99 out of 100 times that they, they come up with an idea and nothing is used? Why would you even want to be there? What are you working for? What are you coming to work for? Why are you losing sleep over this man's bullshit? <laughs> I know, I know that if I'm working retail and I got a fucking idiot that I'm working with who's stealing 99 out of 100 fucking sales that come through the door because he's selfish and greedy, I'm not working there. Or at least I'm going to complain to the fucking boss. In this case, they can't complain to the boss. You can complain to anybody you want. You can't change Vince's mind. The entire creative team has pitched to have Raw and SmackDown look completely different with different production in a different way of shooting things, and Vince McMahon shoots it down. 2016, for example, go back and watch SmackDown Live from August to December. It felt, it looked, it was different compared to Monday Night Raw. That all changed. You don't see those camera angles anymore. It's the same way. They, 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 they start these shows the same way. These shows feel the same. These shows have the same fucking boring storylines. These shows have the same fucking commentary teams in the same way they, that, that they deliver commentary. It's disgusting. It is absolutely fucking disgusting. If you watch Raw, there's literally no reason to watch SmackDown Live. And if you watch SmackDown Live, there's absolutely no reason you should watch Monday Night Raw. None. None. But this was something that was instituted in 2016. They wanted, or USA Network wanted SmackDown Live to be separate from Monday Night Raw. They wanted it to have this different feel, being that it was moving to Tuesdays live. Where's USA Network now? Why aren't they, are they even watching what the fuck is going on? I, I know if I have eagle eyes and I'm a representative for USA Network and I'm watching these shows... Vince, why is SmackDown Live kind of similar to what Monday Night Raw is doing? There's no difference between these shows. Vince doesn't want it that way. Vince, yes, 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 the USA Network representatives, and then goes and changes it anyway. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. This is something that I find to be hilarious, because if he did, he would actually see... Actually, if Vince McMahon did this next thing, we wouldn't have it anymore. If he watched what I'm about to tell you... I don't think it would be around anymore. Or not at least at the level in which we see it now. Vince McMahon doesn't keep track of what's going on in NXT. He maybe watches takeover shows. I'm going to say the answer is no to watching takeover shows. Now, I remember hilariously that people were watching NXT TakeOver UK in Blackpool, right? And Vince McMahon tweeted out on Twitter, I was watching... No, you weren't. You weren't watching. There's no way that you were. Why the fuck would you be? Because if you did watch, you'd see how things are supposed to be done when it comes to presenting pro wrestling on Monday and Tuesday nights. He refuses anything in NXT. He don't even watch it. Meanwhile, Triple H came out months ago saying, yeah, uh, Vince McMahon is very supportive of NXT. He watches NXT. There were even reports back last year, I believe, that Vince McMahon, or maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, I don't know, that Vince McMahon was backstage watching 
the TakeOver show, the ladder match, TakeOver New Orleans, where Adam Cole wrestled twice. Apparently, there were reports that Vince McMahon wanted Adam Cole to wrestle twice. No, we what? No, we didn't. That wasn't Vince McMahon's call. That wasn't Vince McMahon's call at all. So why the bullshit? Oh, Vince watches NXT. Maybe if he did, we wouldn't have the quality of NXT that we get now. Seriously. That roster would be plucked one by one if Vince was watching NXT. He'd have Dream on the main roster tomorrow. Seriously. Adam Cole would be on the main roster right now if he watched NXT. So I'm glad that he doesn't. But I wish at some point he did tune into a takeover to see what Triple H is doing. Because maybe, maybe, doubtful, but maybe, if he's seen what Triple H is doing with TakeOver, then maybe, A, he would realize what needs to be done, B, what the fans really want to see, and C, maybe he'd give Triple H a little bit more power. Because if Triple H is doing so many great things with TakeOver and NXT and storylines and character development, then maybe Vince McMahon would see that, and I don't really know how he doesn't see that, because as a boss, your main thing should be to turn over duties and responsibilities to everybody else. Why a boss in Vince McMahon? I really don't understand this mentality. Why you want to do everything. He's in a position that he should be giving responsibility to other people to make the shows look and feel and sound and just generate interest and feel different. None of that happens. I, I, I don't understand that. I know if I'm a boss, I want to turn over responsibility. And I don't know, I don't know how you can't trust your own fucking family. Why wouldn't you trust Triple H? She's got a track record of doing great things. It's because Vince McMahon, and I mean this wholeheartedly, man, I bet the fucking bank account on it. Vince does not want anybody to succeed where he has failed. Vince would rather see this company dead than in the hands of somebody else who's going to do a better job than him. I guarantee fucking to you. And I don't know these people from a fucking hole in the wall. The writers say he just watches WWE and works out and is not aware of things going on in the real world. Well, I'm sure he knows AEW just signed on to be with TNT. That's the, that's the only thing that he needs to concern himself with right now because competition is speeding up on you, motherfucker. They're in a Ferrari in the fucking right lane waiting to fucking pass you at 90 miles an hour and cut you off. You better stop paying attention. Meanwhile, so many things are going on on the indies. You'd think if somebody was in tune, if somebody loved, if somebody loved pro wrestling, you'd think you'd have a fucking finger on the pulse of what's going on, what's popular, who's in, who's out, who's the hottest thing, what's the best match of the week, what's the best match of the year, what's the best pay-per-view of the year, who are we scouting, who are we looking at? That guy has nothing. Nothing of that instinctive nature to go out there and fucking feel any way outside of WWE. That in itself, that's all I need to hear. For this guy to be removed, that's all I need to hear. Everything else is a given. But like that, if that is your mentality, that's not somebody who should be running this company. That's not the guy I want in charge. The writers say that there is no chance of Vince McMahon stepping down. Well, there you go, folks. We... We may be dead ourselves before Vince McMahon fucking passes away. Vince McMahon plans on running the XFL and WWE. Brad Shepard reported that there's no indication of Vince McMahon giving up his spot in WWE to focus on the XFL. This theory was set into high gear after Triple H liked and unliked a tweet that suggested this initial report. However, this is not the case. It just means that Vince McMahon will have even more on his plate. Again, he doesn't want to delegate responsibilities. You, you mean to tell me you think the product is going to get better when Vince McMahon runs the XFL and the WWE on Mondays and Tuesdays and then he's doing the XFL on fucking Sundays? Seriously? I, I, I don't get that mentality. You think it's going to get better. You think the, the product is going to get better quality-wise on Monday and Tuesday night. I am anticipating it getting worse. Does this man sleep? Does he recharge his batteries with a, a, a fucking rechargeable battery? Does he sit in the office and fucking have himself plugged into the fucking wall? Does Kevin Dunn come over? <laughs> uh, Vince, it's time to change your batteries. I don't get it. Why? Why would you want 
so much work to do. You're 74 years old. Guy can barely speak in front of a live audience. And he's going to run the XFL, Raw, and SmackDown? <laughs> this company is going to be so much worse in 2020, man. Believe me. So far, Vince McMahon's pattern is getting more and more similar to what he did in 2001, where he does both, and the entire company basically does both as well. Not looking forward to it whatsoever. Dana Brooke. Dana Brooke. Dana Strawberry Cheesecake with fucking uh, strawberry drizzle. Man, that made me hungry. I go for some nice New York cheesecake, man, with some strawberry drizzle. Ooh, sounds good. Titus, where are you, bro? Uh, anyway, Dana Brooke has been the hardest worker for the last three years. That's great. That's great. If she's the hardest worker for the past three years, why isn't she on TV? Why doesn't she have an identity for herself? All I know is Dana Brooke. Dana Brooke. You called her up too soon from NXT. You buried her on the main roster. You treated her like fucking shit. You didn't present her to the live audience. Now I'm supposed to care about Dana Brooke because she's the hardest worker in the last three years. How the fuck do I know that? She goes to the performance center every week. She shows up early and helps set up the ring and she gets in the ring so she can get better. Creative will pitch something for her and she gets nothing up until money in the bank. Why is that? Why is that? Vince seen another blonde? He's like, oh, how many more blondes can we get on TV? Sasha's not here. Let's just bury Sasha some more with some more blondes. You got Carmella now turning blonde once again after the hair color change. You got Charlotte Flair. You got Lacey Evans. You got uh, Alexa Bliss. Blondes everywhere. Why is Dana Brooke getting a shot at money in the bank? Could be because Sasha Banks is out or it could be because she got some enhancements done. And she got some plastic surgery, she got some lip injections, or she got some cosmetic work done in some fashion. That's the only reason why Dana Brooke is on TV. Now, after three years, you want to push Dana Brooke. Now, I didn't want to see Dana Brooke then. I don't want to see Dana Brooke now. Three years of wasting somebody is not going to make me say, oh, oh, look, Dana Brooke is here. She deserves an opportunity. She hasn't shown me anything for me to invest my time in. I don't see anything from Dana Brooke that is going to make me say, oh, she deserves an opportunity. She's done nothing. She's done nothing. She didn't do anything in NXT. And if she did something in NXT, then I might be a little bit more open to giving her an opportunity. But she didn't do anything then, and she hasn't done anything now. And the only reason why she's on TV is because she's a blonde bimbo. The caller offered to tell Wade Keller off the air some cool storylines that were pitched and never used. I would love to hear what these guys have pitched and was never used. The writer has talked and said, we're all working for Dana Warrior now, and it's really awkward. There you go. Dana Warrior is someone who wanted a job with the WWE, away from whatever she's doing. Vince McMahon gave her a job. It was reported to be an intern-like job that would hopefully lead to something more, and here she is now. I'm assuming she's part head of creative. Dana Warrior. I don't know what that means, but clearly, by the looks of these shows, it ain't going right. So how the fuck do you feel that Dana Warrior is going to be making creative decisions that Vince McMahon's going to listen to more, just based off who she is, than some fucking writer who's got really great ideas and cool ideas that never gets used? How do you think those guys feel? Awful. Absolutely awful. The Fox WWE contract prohibits Fox from moving the show to FS1 even if the ratings drop. Wade Keller did talk about this on the PW Torch on his recap show for Monday Night Raw. Said that WWE has a very good deal with Fox indeed. In fact, their deal is so airtight that they have it in their wording that their deal cannot be changed and Fox cannot move the show to FS1. If the WWE Fox deal does have the wording which prohibits Fox, Fox from moving SmackDown Live to FS1, then that makes Fox comments about the blue brand being short-term on the main network on Fridays even more interesting. Hopefully, WWE will bring in a ton of viewers, and they will fully cross-promote with all resources that Fox and Disney has no problem with. Because the goal is for SmackDown to be a success, there is, so there is no need to even approach the subject of moving the show. Now, people were also worried about SmackDown Live moving to three hours. This is shot down. It is not happening. Fox unveiled their primetime schedule this past week for 2019 and 2020. And per Fightful and Sean Ross Sapp, it shows that SmackDown will be shown on Friday nights weekly from 8 
to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This would certainly make it seem as if the report suggesting SmackDown is moving to three hours. False. Good. Good. This company needs to actually take away hours of programming during the week. Less is more. Quality over quantity. This is something that the company just doesn't understand because they're so analytic. Right? They need that watch time and that audience retention on the network. Meanwhile, you're killing your fucking shows. And the reason why Monday Night Raw ratings are in the fucking toilet is because if you look at that third hour, it's generating a 1.8, 1.9 on most weeks. That third hour gives you a terrible sense of the overall rating. That third hour is killing the overall rating of the show. I wish Raw was from 8 to 10 or 9 to 11. Two hours. So SmackDown not moving to three hours is a godsend right now for WWE. It is unknown at this time if SmackDown will be three hours at all or if 205 Live is the third hour and the rumored three hours is going to be two hours of SmackDown and one hour of 205 Live on FS1. I'd move 205 Live back down to Full Sail University and tape it at Full Sail and have it appear live every single week. Well, that's too much money though, right? Too much production costs. For WWE. It's been hyped since the deal that Fox and WWE have merged together that they would be heavily promoting the blue brand during the NFL season, which has led this to believe, or, or the belief rather, that the show could see a big increase in viewership, which has been struggling for several months now. So WWE, you know, I, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. WWE should be in the nature of wanting to change because their products are so fucking terrible right now for Raw and SmackDown. So you're banking on Fox to do what you should be doing. You're banking on Fox to promote so you get bigger viewership. And when people see the quality of the shows that are on now, they're not going to watch. You might pop a big rating for the big show on uh, on the debut, but after that, people are going to realize how fucking terrible this is. And you're only, you've only brought back part-timers that are not going to be there every fucking week. And the ratings are going to go right back to where they are now. Don't be lazy. Get better because you want to get better. Don't sit there and wait for Fox to fix your fucking mistakes. McMahon noted in an interview that Fox is going all in with the promotion of the show. He also praised NBC Universal, which is the parent company of the USA Network that airs Raw. WWE talent will be appearing on Fox programming, McMahon says. It's going to be a totally integrated approach. We've never had a platform like this in terms of promotion. Fox is going all in, and they're great promoters. He adds NBC Universal is also going to step up as well to be the equivalent of what Fox is going to do. Blah, 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 blah. Change. If I don't see change now, what makes you think that change is going to happen in October? When Fox gets SmackDown, you think Raw is going to change because Fat SmackDown is going to be a better show? I hope so. Book better shows. Write better shows. That should be your priority. After that, things will happen. It's going to take a while. It's not going to be something that's going to be fixed after a fucking week. SmackDown Live ratings. Speaking of the ratings, lowest rating since the 2006 brand split. Headlined by Kofi Kingston and Kevin Owens, 1.827 million views. There you go. One of the most boring shows I think SmackDown has ever produced since 2006. God awful. Down 21%, 22% from the 2.298 million viewers compared to last year. Where'd those people go? Just last year, where the fuck did they go? Did they all of a sudden become desensitized to fucking pro wrestling? Or are you booking shitty fucking shows to a point where these people are not interested in what you're providing them? I think that's the reason. WWE is having major issues with backstage morale. Brian Alvarez said on the Wrestling Observer Live, from what he hears, morale is possibly the worst it's ever been, which is a pretty damning report on the current climate of WWE. WWE remains in a standoff with former women's and tag team champion Sasha Banks, who requested a release from the company after WrestleMania. Current reports suggest that WWE is promising Banks a lot of things to get her back into the company, but no sign of her return right now is imminent. Luke Harper, Vince McMahon's least favorite person right now for whatever fucking reason, if reports are to be, be, to be believed, asked for his release, a request which answered uh, was answered rather by WWE adding six months to his contract so he can't go anywhere until after WrestleMania. So making people stay when they don't want to is making them unhappy. 
There you go. Who would have thought adding time on top of somebody's contract when they don't want to be there? They don't want to be there because Vince is clearly in the position of not having any plans for said person. Say, say Luke Harper. Oh, he can't do a Southern accent. Oh, he can't do this. Oh, I, I didn't like what he did with EC3. Oh, I'm not going to, going to assign him to a brand. Do you know what that does to someone's morale? Do you think Luke Harper, Luke Harper wants to be, you know, sitting at home? You don't think he wants to be on TV, healthy, providing, working, getting his brand out there? WWE, if they didn't want Luke Harper, they're doing the right thing with him. Bury him. Keep him at home. Pay him, keep him at home, keep him out of sight's eye. So when he does leave, he goes to AEW, he's got absolutely no momentum underneath them. It's going to work reverse for the Revival. WWE is treating the Revival like garbage, and... They're embarrassing them every week. You don't think people are going to feel sympathetic for the Revival? The more the people see the Revival is getting buried knowing how talented they are, they're going to get over, and when their contracts are up, they're going to go somewhere else and blow everybody's minds. So I hope Vince McMahon knows what he's doing. Seeing your fellow stars and friends being treated this way is probably not the greatest morale boosters either. Clearly, Luke Harper was used as an example. The Revival was used as an example. People who are wanting to X for their release publicly and go on social media. They can't do that anymore. People who have been hurt are afraid of speaking up just for the sake of having time added to their contracts. Who knows, WWE might look at everybody and see who was injured in the past 12 months, and they might add time on top of their contracts just for the sake of it. And you know if they do that, what the reason is. Because there's no reason to treat somebody that miserably. When Neville walked out, there was a crazy shouting match, and he flipped out on Vince McMahon, and that was the last time they saw him. Never came back. The writers praised Neville for being so easy to work with. Now, now Neville's part of AEW. He's going to be on the biggest independent show of all time. What happened? Ideas never pan out as originally planned because writers will come up with stuff, and then Vince loses interest in a week or two. Mojo Rawley is a good example. Wade Keller had someone call in, which I'm reading the transcript of. They mentioned Mojo Rawley. Mojo Rawley was mentioned as a perfect example as this was being talked about. He was featured on Raw for a few weeks and then disappeared before eventually eventually making his in-ring return debut with this new gimmick, this broken glass mirror gimmick that we seen on Monday in our Raw where he beat Apollo Crews, who took advantage of the wild card rule for what, I don't know, and lost in 90 seconds to Mojo Rawley. Now that Mojo Rawley's new persona has finally debuted, only time will tell when Vince McMahon will get bored of Mojo again, eventually. Vince McMahon reportedly decided, this goes with the Mojo Rawley situation, reportedly decided to hate anything Luke Harper does. Fightful reports that a source told them that Vince McMahon himself seemed to have a long-term issue with Luke Harper and whatever happened wouldn't have mattered anyway going as far to say that Vince McMahon decided to hate anything he was involved in a long time ago. Then why employ him? Why pay him? This is unfortunate for Harper, who is healthy. There's no convincing Vince McMahon that Harper could be of value. Yet they don't want to let him leave the company. Clearly, you find some value in him to keep him on the fucking roster, but if you do find value in him like you're pretty much telling us without actually saying it, fucking use the guy. Use him. The money is good, and it's a dream job for many creative writers, but it gets frustrating. The talent is very unhappy, and the people are trying to get out of their contracts. I don't give a fuck how much money a creative writer makes, I know that if I am brought in to creatively write and you're not giving me the ideas uh, or you're not giving me the pen to creatively write for you or my ideas are not being used, why the fuck is it even a purpose to be there? Why would you want such a job like that? Do you think anybody else is going to be reading these reports and wanting to be a creative writer for WWE? This is why they hire outside fucking people. People who don't watch WWE because if you did work in the wrestling business and you did work for a wrestling promotion and you know the fucking nightmares that are going on in WWE, you'd never take a position like that. So yeah, they're going to turn around and get somebody from the Bachelorette who's got no wrestling knowledge whatsoever. They're going to get some fucking geek. <laughs> uh, wrestling? What is that? They're going to get some fucking idiot to sit there 
who doesn't know how anything works, and then when he is there, my God, he's going to have his mind blown. That's why they do it. I know if I'm offered a position in WWE to be a creative writer, nope, I'm not even taking a job with the WWE, period. On-air personality, commentator, anything, man. Everything is so scrutinized and picked apart and micromanaged. Nobody needs to be in an environment like that. Nobody is going to thrive and be successful in that type of environment. The writers say Bruce Pritchard is a pleasure to work with. He's funny, pleasure to work with, but he's not even getting through to Vince McMahon either after initial reports of Bruce being hired for the position of being Vince McMahon's right-hand man. Why the fuck did he take the job to begin with? Man, they must be paying him very well. Very well. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I'm sure Bruce Pritchard has a lot of good ideas. If Bruce is not getting through to Vince McMahon, nobody's getting through to Vince McMahon. Someone who's got close to 30 years of working with that fucking man. He's pretty much family. And he's not getting through. Shane McMahon, Triple H, and Stephanie McMahon have all tried to talk to Vince McMahon, but he does not listen. Shane McMahon was also reportedly shut out of the creative process. Wrestling Observer Newsletter notes that Shane does pitch ideas, but they rarely get used. Triple H. Triple H doesn't get nearly the face time with the chairman, as one might think, which we reported on. Meltzer confirmed that. This makes you wonder who Vince McMahon is taking all these suggestions from that continually watered down WWE's product. Who? Who? I don't get it. Who is telling him whatever he needs to know? Or, or what is he, where is he hearing these ideas from? And why is he not listening to others who are only there who want to see the product get better? Who know the cries on social media are getting too much week and week and week and week and week after one after another. Why? I don't get it. The people on the writing staff listen to podcasts and they hear the fans bashing them. It breaks their heart. I apologize. I know it's not you guys. It's Vince McMahon. Vince is in the announcer's ear to a sentence and he gets on them for tiny mistakes. One of the worst things about every single WWE program... Raw, SmackDown, and pay-per-views on the main roster is the way the commentary sounds, man. That commentary is fucking god-awful. From Renee Young to Michael Cole to Corey Graves, who I who I really looked up to as a fucking color commentator when he was in NXT. The fact that he is doing what he's doing now and he is not even close to resembling what he was... This commentary team is fucking terrible. The bickering between Saxton and Corey Graves on Tuesday nights. Tom Phillips not really sounding organic as he did in NXT. Michael Cole, you could listen to the first UK tournament where he called it with Nigel McGuinness. How great he sounded. Look at what we got to hear on Monday night. Why is it Mauro Ranallo on Tuesday nights doing the SmackDown commentary duties to be the voice of that show? You think... Moro Ronaldo is the type of guy you're going to really suppress Moro in that commentary chair by feeding him shit that you want him to say. You don't feed a man like Moro Ronaldo anything to say. The man is so diligent in his work. The man comes up with so much creativity as far as what he wants to say during a match. You're going to suppress that man and tell that man what to say? What is the bickering between Byron Saxton and Corey Graves? Who finds that funny? I don't want to hear them bickering. I want them to tell me what is going on in the ring. I want a Nigel McGuinness who's going to bring out a scenario in the ring as to why someone did a certain situation. Renee Young is fucking terrible. Ow! Ow! Ooh! Oh my God! Ah! How is that pro wrestling commentary? Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn. That's not Sami Zayn promo work. That's Vince McMahon talking through Sami Zayn. There you go. Confirmed. 
Sami Zayn, and whatever he's been saying for the last four weeks is all Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon dances out there to ska music and has a red beard. There you go. I didn't know Vince McMahon was French-Canadian. Unbelievable. We all knew that. Now it's just confirmed right there. Vince McMahon is Sami Zayn. Everything that Sami Zayn has been saying was written by Vince McMahon. That's how Vince McMahon looks at us. Continue making fun of the fans. I know where I'll be on Tuesday nights on TNT. 37 writers, 37 writers in total are now working on both shows. Not one of them gets an idea out there that makes television. 37 writers. Let me reiterate that. 37 writers and these shows are this bad. How is that even fucking possible? That is goddamn fucking embarrassing. NBC, Universal, and Fox both want the top stars. Oh, Vince is a genius. He came up with the wild card rule. You either go all in or you fucking dump the wild card rule. Seriously. There's no, there's no reason. Or dump the brand split, rather. Get rid of the wild card rule and dump the fucking brand split. There's no reason. There's absolutely no reason. There's no reason for two women's championships. There's no reason for two tag team titles. There's no reason. There's no reason for two world championships. None. How many legit guys on that roster, on Raw and SmackDown, can you honestly say are world championship material? Do you really need two world championships? They both want the top stars. What are you going to do? How long do you think you're going to keep up this bullshit of the wild card rule? Huh? Bullshit. It's eventually going to get worse. It's eventually going to get worse. You ain't going to be seeing an Apollo Crews come over from SmackDown Live to go on Monday Night Raw, or you're not going to see a Zack Ryder go over to fucking SmackDown Live from Monday Night Raw. When they move to Fox, you're going to see the Reigns, the Rollins, the Lesners, the Rouseys, the Charlottes, the Beckys. You're going to be seeing guys on the undercard. It's going to fucking fail. Get used to it now. You've seen Apollo Crews on Monday Night, right? Guys like that will never go. Rusev or Nakamura, you ain't gonna be seeing guys like that. You're not gonna be seeing guys like that, which is a goddamn fucking shame. Andrade Cien Almas went into Vince's office and asked for a legit push. Vince looked at him and said, and I quote, learn some English and get back to me. Andrade spoke English last week and he's been taking English lessons. WWE actually found an English translator for, or an English teacher for Andrade because he is universally loved backstage and they want to see him succeed. How fucking sad is that? WWE, uh, everybody that's not Vince McMahon, went out and found someone to teach Andrade English because he's universally loved backstage. Former NXT champion was reportedly told by Vince McMahon to learn English and then get back to me about giving him a push. Andrade did that and he is now working on the English language with an English tutor, according to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Andrade is universally loved backstage, and Vince McMahon wants to push him. WWE's Talent Relations Department also assisted in acquiring an English language tutor for him. Look at that. Andrade also received great reviews from his work on live events from producers. His ability in the ring is not being overlooked, and everyone is very positive with him right now. His hard work has paid off when it comes to learning English as well which saw him get his own backstage promos and time on the microphone, despite Zelina Vega being there to provide a mouthpiece for him. I uh, I, I hate hearing shit like this, man. You know, I, I never understood. You know, it, it makes you think why WWE even goes out and hires this, this international talent and, and why this international talent gets called up to the main roster when you all know for a fact that Vince McMahon is so set in his ways that if he hears a guy like Io Shirai or a Kairi Sane or an Asuka, Shinsuke Nakamura... This is why uh, Kushida is doomed right from the word go, you know? You use that DeLorean and travel right back to fucking New Japan. Please, please. People like this have a ceiling in WWE, and we all know that this talent can break through that fucking ceiling and grab whatever brass rings that are there, but Vince McMahon doesn't allow it because they don't speak English. They don't speak English. I, I, I don't get it. Vince McMahon gets rid of managers... Then he wants everybody to speak English. I believe managers still have a part on WWE television and could provide a very entertaining aspect to all these shows, just like a Paul Heyman, just like a Zelina Vega, right? I, I don't understand why there's no managers or valets. 
I don't get it anymore. Lana did it with Rusev. Rusev looked better when Lana was speaking for him. Even though Rusev has his personality, that doesn't mean he can't speak. Andrade, he has gotten a lot better. He sounds a lot better than I remember him ever sounding in NXT. But there's a reason why Zelina is with him. She should still be doing the majority of talking for him. There's a reason why you called him up. You called him up because he's fucking great. You called him up because he's one of the best wrestlers that you employ. This goes to show you again that Vince McMahon does not give a shit about professional wrestling. Yes, Vince needs to make money. Yes, 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 Vince has to run a business. But th there's nobody else on the roster that you could say is, a, is better than an Andrade Cien Almas. There's nobody that you can pinpoint is better. Randy Orton's part-time, seemingly. John Cena is almost semi-retired. The Undertaker's gone. Lesnar's gone. Rousey's gone. There's no stars. So who are you to say that somebody else is better than Andrade because they speak English and he doesn't? They're all on the same level. Why the fuck did you call him up? He called him up and you had him waste away for a full year. Now that he goes into your office, speak English. So not only do we realize that WWE career doesn't know what to fucking do with NXT talent, Vince McMahon is a clear-cut discriminatory, discriminatory douchebag. Simple. What wrestling promoter are you going to be if a guy comes into your office and barely speaks it, speak English and then get back to me? Who the fuck says that to somebody? Meanwhile, he's universally loved backstage. For his in-ring work, yes. But I'm also sure he's universally loved as well because he's taking care uh, of their, their baby, Charlotte Flair. He's being good to Charlotte Flair. As long as he maintains that that level of respect and does what he needs to do as a man, Andrade's going to have a great career. He's already on the right path. You know, the man is set for life if he's associated with Charlotte Flair. But man, telling somebody to speak English and then come back to me? Now you know why Asuka is where she is. Now you know why the Kabuki Warriors are a fucking thing. That's what Vince McMahon thinks, right? Now you know why Shinsuke Nakamura didn't even sniff a WWE Championship, when we all know, I say this every fucking time it's brought up, Shinsuke Nakamura should have beat Jinder Mahal for the WWE Championship at Hell in a Cell in 2017. Ridiculous. The Firefly Funhouse with Bray Wyatt is all Bray Wyatt's idea. Bray is described as an absolute genius and helps other wrestlers write their promos. He's one of the best guys in the locker room. Clear cut, something we all knew. Bray is absolutely just ingrained in whatever he's doing, man. He made that fucking gimmick work, which WWE failed him on. You know, the cult leader with Luke Harper, Eric Rowan, Wyatt family, brilliant fucking stuff when I first seen it, man. I absolutely fell in love with whatever he did. The way he spoke, the way he articulated things, the way he got his point across. WWE failed Bray Wyatt. I'm waiting to see how long it takes them to fail Bray Wyatt now. Simple way to go with Bray Wyatt. Win. How do you book Bray Wyatt from here? Win. Simple. The writers he talked to say they loved when there was a real brand split. I'm all for a real brand split. I've been lobbying for a brand split since 2016. I've said you gotta keep you gotta keep it up. I want separate brands. I really do. The only reason why I say I don't want the brand split anymore is because you, you, you're, you're painting a picture as to as to the brand split not even existing. You've wasted our fucking time doing a shake-up only to do the wild card rule. It's like the brand split doesn't even exist. I'd rather, I'd rather see it end or you completely go all the way with it. That's my point. You can't be in the middle. You can't do things to appease this one and appease that one. You gotta do what's best for your fucking show. WWE has all the fucking resources and the assets to make these shows great. Vince McMahon's to blame. Vince McMahon is to blame. He mentioned the revival and the Usos storyline being done because Vince simply thinks it's funny. So we're taking two of the best tag teams on the planet and we're using them as comedy for Vince McMahon instead of putting them in the ring and showcasing why they're the two best tag teams on the planet. Meanwhile, you got AEW who's assembling probably the best tag team division on the fucking planet right now. And you got these two teams, one in the Revival who want to go to the competition, eventually will happen. 
and you're not using tag team wrestling. Is tag team wrestling going to flourish on WWE television when the Young Bucks and the Lucha Bros tear the fucking house down in Las Vegas? Huh? What, what, what's it going to take for WWE to use tag team wrestling and, and to not use these teams in a comedic fucking scenario? Are, are you going to mimic what Double or Nothing is going to do? Are you going to mimic what AEW is going to do with their tag team wrestling? Because the fucking, the executive vice presidents over there are one of the best tag teams, the most influential tag teams on the planet. You're going to look at what they're doing and then you're going to institute that for your own division? Why wasn't it being done already? Why is NXT making tag team wrestling relevant? Why is NXT tag team wrestling main event? Why is NXT tag team wrestling in the top three matches of the fucking year already? Why? And WWE can't get it right. Vince McMahon rather see the Usos come over from SmackDown who are serious as serious can be with the Uso, Uso Penitentiary, now they're promoting Usi Hot. The Revival in NXT, brilliant workers on the main roster, nothing more than fucking comedic jokers. What a disgrace. Yet this is a man that's running a fucking pro wrestling company. And, and Kapoor and the Monday Night Raw writing team write to appease one man. They're writing to make Vince McMahon laugh. And they're giving the middle finger to all the fucking fans. Disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. Some of the writers think Road Dog will eventually end up in AEW. Road Dog is currently on hiatus, and there's no word on when he will be back or what will he will be doing when he returns. Aha! But Road Dog, his expected role when he comes back to the WWE, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter notes that Road Dog took some time off because he was so stressed and feeling so much pressure from his former creative writing assignment. He is expected to make a return, and though... Uh, nobody knows, it is expected and rumored that he will work for Triple H in some form. He will probably be moved down to NXT because Triple H knows that his best buddy, one of his best buddies, is feeling the pressure and he understands what he feels working on the main roster and how your creative ideas are not going to get out there. Maybe Road Dogg and his creative ideas could be a brilliant fucking thing for NXT. Maybe Triple H doesn't want to see another good fucking human being that he's worked all his career with go to the fucking enemy team. He's already got Billy Gunn over there. Triple H knows for a simple fact that if Road Dogg is unhappy and he wants out, he's going to go right to fucking Billy Gunn and work as a fucking producer agent in AEW. You don't want that. Triple H doesn't want to keep having Vince McMahon supply the enemy with great minds and great talent. So I have a home for you in NXT. I wish that could be said about the Ascension. I wish that could be said about Tyler Breeze. I wish that could be said about Bailey. I wish that could be said about Sasha Banks. EC3, heavy machinery. Take them all back, please. Everybody is just wasting away because Vince McMahon would rather see fucking Usi hot on Monday Night Raw. Finally, Vince McMahon believed to be open to too much suggestion and ultimately does nothing with it. Now, this is coming from The Observer. It is stated in The Observer that there's been too much input from too many people on the team who haven't figured out that when you change something in a story, it has a ripple effect on every aspect of the story. He solicits so much input, does Vince, from so many people that it leads to things being watered down. If Vince McMahon is accepting more ideas and trying to cater to those suggestions, then it could end up changing the overall mood of any creative direction. This is attributed to having too many fucking cooks in the kitchen. 37 fucking cooks. Can you imagine what that would be like in a restaurant, man? 37 cooks? Do you really need 37 fucking cooks? Do you really need 37 creative writers on both of these shows? I don't understand. And then their ideas are not being used anyway. So he's taking this input and he's doing nothing with it. He's got so many fucking ideas that the original idea planned out, he's going to go with something on his own, and he's going to ruin everything, and it's a ripple-down effect, like they said. Folks, this is some of the most damning information that I've ever reported on, on this podcast. I want nothing but the best from WWE. So much talent, so much promise, the foundation has been built with NXT, Whatever is being done in NXT, from backstage morale to what you see on TV, the way storylines are handled, the way takeovers are handled, everything that is done in NXT 
needs to be done on the main roster. And that is not going to be unless Vince McMahon is gone. I don't understand how Vince is paying 37 riders. I don't understand how Vince McMahon is paying talent to sit at home. And these shows are the way that they are. Every single week. Lifeless. Soulless. There's no passion. There's no love. The people that are running these shows do not love professional wrestling. And that is the biggest fucking thing that we all, I think, could take away from this. And it starts at the top. People who work for Vince McMahon on his right side and Vince McMahon himself do not love professional wrestling. They loathe everything about professional wrestling. And we need someone in there who understands that they're on a losing streak right now. We need someone in there who's going to understand that change and new ideas and new faces and new minds are exactly what this company needs. Vince McMahon, I will say this again, is in a position where he doesn't want to see anyone else come in and do a better job than him. He's damaging his entire team. He's damaging Raw and SmackDown every single week with the, with this mentality. He'd rather see this company die than someone come in there and do a better job than him. I would not even be surprised at this stage of the game that WWE, when Vince dies, there will be no more WWE. I think at that point, he will have killed off every single aspect of this company that still remains. For the simple fact that I just mentioned, he doesn't want anyone to come into his position, even after death, and do a better job than him. He wants to be the man up top. He never wants to be the guy that's forgotten because we all know when... And, and, and I love when people say that Triple H is going to go in there and nothing's going to change. I, I find that very difficult to believe. You can't get worse than you are right now. You can't. When Triple H comes in there and everything starts to get back to where we need it, people are going to forget about what Vince McMahon did. He's only going to be remembered for all the fucking bullshit that he's caused in the last five to ten years. He knows that. This is how I feel. And I would not be surprised if that is 100% on point. This needs to change. If the coach and his team are going through a massive losing streak like WWE, the first thing that you need to do is get the head coach out of position and replace him with someone who's going to get the team back on a winning streak. Where's my winning streak? Where's our winning streak? How do you have so many players on your team with so many great ideas that could help this team in the long run flourish and develop and be great again? How can you employ all these people and just waste their ideas away and kill their spirits all in one snap of a finger? How? How? WWE is, from what I read here, the one company that I don't think anyone is going to work for or want to work for. If you are in the wrestling business and you are a passionate wrestling fan or a wrestler or a writer or an agent, the only reason why people use WWE is to pad their resume and put, I work for WWE all while collecting a paycheck. Too many people in that company are content on what they're being paid and there's not enough people willing to speak up and make a fucking difference. This is off the script. I'm getting out of here, guys. For right now, we'll hit the intro. We got a lot more. You thought this was it. I got a lot more to go over today. Right here on episode 274. This is off the script. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. This is mine. So I'm on social media last night, man, and I'm following the wrestling news account, Raja. And within seconds, I'm scrolling through my Twitter feed and I'm reading, you know, whatever I need to. Just catching up on some things. I'm going back and forth with Sal Rex about whatever, whatever's going on in the community. And I'm following Raja and their wrestling news and they put out a tweet seconds after I'm scrolling through my feed and I see this. And it's in a very bizarre manner. They actually scared a lot of people with what they did. 
Now, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but, you know, if they heard something, I really would appreciate people just fucking let the news out there instead of just holding it back and whatever. People attributed their their weird tweet to Ric Flair. People thought, hours after Ric Flair had went through a successful procedure to replace his pacemaker, that something happened to Ric Flair. Thank God, nothing happened to Ric Flair. But they mentioned that Ashley Massaro died at the age of 39. And I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck, man? Too young, man. 39 years old. I don't even know what to say. It's Mental Health Awareness Month. And it's so sad to see everybody come out in support of her. And a lot of people who are dealing with mental health issues and and going through depression. Seek help. You know, don't ever feel like you're alone. Find someone to talk to. I've seen tweets from Shelly Martinez, her best friend, Corey Graves, everybody in the wrestling community, everybody that's worked with Ashley Massaro in WWE, man. Such a terrible situation. 39 years old, man, that's, that's fucking ridiculous. That's just too young for anybody to, to go away. You know, she was the former... WWE Diva Search winner in 2005. She was obviously part, as you guys remember, part of Paul London and Brian Kendrick's act as WWE Tag Team Champions. She had a great look to her. She was punk rock all the way. Right? She had that rebel look. Women's Championship match against Melina at WrestleMania 23. She was part of the Lumberjill match, the Playboy Bunny Mania Lumberjill match. I know, I know. At WrestleMania 24, she left the company in 2008, and I do believe she was actually beginning to get back into the ring. She was actually physically training to get back into the squared circle again, and a lot of people said that she was in the best spirits that she could possibly be in, which it it makes me, it makes me really wonder what the fuck is going on, man. It's like, it's so fucking crazy. It really is. Everybody, everybody from people who've who've known her, they, they said she looked great. She was she was feeling great. She was actually planning a trip to Las Vegas for her birthday on the day in which they found her dead. Shelly Martinez actually tweeted out, My best friend from wrestling died from suicide two days after responding to 300 plus fan letters. She was the happiest I have ever seen her in years. So stoked that people still cared about her 11 years after her career was over. There are no signs. It comes without warning. If you're going through the worst shit in life, let... Please seek help. Just know that you are not alone. End quote. It's it's so sad, man. It's 39 years old. 39 days found dead. 39 days at the age of 39. 39 days after WrestleMania. You know, a lot of people say that there are meanings in the numbers. You know, it's just, it's so weird, man, how these things happen. And then, and then this morning I wake up and I, and I have my coffee and I look at my Twitter feed and Grumpy Cat passed away at seven years old. Such a fucking cute little thing that brought smiles to so many people's faces, you know, and my heart goes out to her owner, Tabitha. I love Grumpy Cat, man. I really did. It's it's, just, it's such a sad a sad fucking thing to see. I, it's it's so terrible, man. Yeah, you know, Ashley passing away at thirty nine, and then Grumpy Cat, and they they say things come in threes. You know, we had the Ric Flair scare yesterday. Thank God he's okay. Conrad actually had to come out during a Starcast media call with people in the community, getting people ready for next week, saying that TMZ actually blew the fucking thing out of proportion. They made it seem like he was fucking dying, and that's all we. That's all we needed on yesterday afternoon, on Thursday afternoon. Oh, he's in dire straits. He, it's in serious condition. He, he's rushed to the hospital. People, people were like, what the fuck? So, so much so that people, garbage fucking people creating troll accounts, pretending to be the WWE official Twitter account, breaking news, which people were falling for, stating that Ric Flair had passed in the hospital in Atlanta. Conrad had to come out during the media call and say they blew it out of proportion. He was just in the hospital 
for a routine procedure. The family knew this was coming. And all he did was get his pacemaker replaced. They said you could do it before StarCast or do it after StarCast. He wanted to do it before StarCast because he wanted to get it out of the way. <laughs> it's unbelievable. My thoughts and prayers go out to Ric Flair for a speedy recovery. Hoping, ho hoping to see him you know, at StarCast in good spirits and good health. My thoughts and prayers go out to everybody that's worked and known Ashley Massaro and to her daughter and her family as well. She was found in her home, a New York girl. There was something that happened on social media as well with Rebby Hardy, Matt Hardy's wife. Apparently, she posted something on Twitter, which people, again, blew completely out of proportion. Now, if you guys are following Rebby Hardy, you know how outspoken she is. And I don't think the woman has a, a cold bone in her body. I, I, I don't think she is what people are making her out to be today. There was a back and forth a couple of months ago between Ashley and Rebby Hardy about, you know, Ashley being a bad influence on Matt when he was going through his personal shit. And, and Rebby called Ashley out on all the bullshit, you know, that, that they, they were spending time together and, you know, he, he was going down the wrong path, being mixed in with her. And there was a huge back and forth, huge cat fight, quote unquote, on social media. So, clearly, they didn't like each other. Rebby clearly didn't like Ashley, and, and Ashley was just coming at Rebby in, in a very foolish way, because who the fuck wants to get into an argument with Rebby Hardy on social media? She will bury you quicker and faster than anything Vince McMahon could possibly do to you. I would never want to get into an argument with that woman in any sense of the word, whether it be verbally on social media or in person. My God. But... After Ashley was reportedly found dead in her home, Rebby tweeted out something in the form of a, a smiley emoji and a kissy emoji. And people were attributing this to, you know, oh, now she's gone. Or, or it was like a, a stab at Ashley's death. And, and I, I don't think that's the case. You know, people on social media want to blow things out of proportion. She was getting death threats. She was legitimately getting death threats over every, and as, as soon as Ashley's death was reported, I'm sure people were tweeting Rebby Hardy because that's what they do. That's all they live for. They live for drama. So she tweeted us. She didn't say nothing. She didn't tweet anything. She tweeted emojis to the haters about whatever they were saying in the form of an emoji. She didn't want to say anything. She didn't have to say anything. She didn't come out and say, oh, I'm glad the bitch is dead or, you know, whatever. She didn't say anything along those lines. People were acting as if Rebby killed Ashley. Now, it might come out in the coming days what the tweets really meant. She might say something on the matter. But until then, people are, are creating their own story on social media. And it's sickening. It really is sickening. So it was a, it was a really sad day in, in that aspect. But... You know, if everybody that was a fan of Ashley's work and, you know, still cared about her to this day and hoping to see her possibly get back into the wrestling business, man, my thoughts and prayers go out to her. 39 years old, man. It's too young for anybody to be leaving us. Way too young, man. This is Off The Script, episode 274. This is part number one, man. We got a lot to go over after what could be considered a full podcast after what we just went over in the beginning. We got a lot to go over, man. News on Saudi Arabia. I also... I also have news on WWE with Goldberg and The Undertaker, what we can expect from that match in Saudi Arabia. Apparently, the whole card is leaked. We'll go over that as well. Brock Lesnar's future in the WWE, why Baron Corbin is getting big wins on Monday Night Raw, Extreme Rules, and John Cena says WWE doesn't need him anymore. Yeah, why don't you ask Vince McMahon that? He'll have John Cena back within minutes if he had the opportunity to do so. So that is what we're going to go over today to close out the podcast, man. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. Please hit that thumbs up if you have not done so already. I really, really appreciate it. Follow me on social media, man, at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. Instagram and Twitter, man, they will be very, very useful to you guys in the coming days because I will be out in Las Vegas. 
I will be there for StarCast. I am part of the media team. I will be there vlogging and taking pictures and giving you guys the heads up on all the happenings at StarCast. Possible video that will be on Twitter and Instagram. So please make sure you guys follow me on Twitter and Instagram. It is the best place for you guys to keep up to date on where I am and what I am doing. I am not. I am not having a formal meet and greet. So if you guys want to come on out and meet me, I'll be at StarCast. I will be at Caesars. I will be at Caesars. That will be my home base. I will be finding some good craft beer bars. And I'm going to meet up with Grimm. I know Grimm's out there. Uh, I want to have a word with Chris Van Vliet. I want to see Brian Zane. He lives out in Vegas. He's going to be there. He's going to be at StarCast. He's going to have his own booth. Steven Larson's going to be out there. I want to uh, have a word with Sean Ross Sapp. He's going to be out there. Going to be great, man. I'm going to, I want to just, just shake everybody's hand and say, you know, I love what you're doing and I want to meet everybody in the community. I believe uh, there might be some big YouTuber thing going on out there. I'll keep you guys informed on where you guys can come and meet us, if not uh, with uh, everybody else that they might mention it. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to let the cat out of the bag yet, but something is apparently in the works with everybody, so I'll keep you guys posted on that. But the best way to know is follow me on Instagram and Twitter, man, at JD from NY206. And I can't wait to get out to Vegas, man, and meet you guys. It's going to be a good time. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing as far as uploading goes, but uh, I should have content up while I'm out there. So keep an eye out for that. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206 if you guys want to support the podcast. On Patreon, completely optional. It's up to you, and it's the only way to get exclusive content not available on YouTube. Uh, I am very sorry I did not get the early access up for you patrons on Off the Script yesterday. Usually, I have the podcast all ready to go by Thursday, but I, I just did not feel well, man. I am very sleep-deprived, and I went to bed uh, relatively early, earlier than I usually do. Yesterday, after, after a couple of beers, I passed out, and I was refreshed to go this morning. So I appreciate you guys being patient with me, man. Sleep is a uh, thing that doesn't come so easy to me anymore. I don't know why. Make sure you guys follow me on all those things. Please do so. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, if you guys missed anything that I uploaded on the channel, Bray Wyatt's secret finally revealed on Raw. You believe that there are mothers out there that are telling WWE that their kids are scared, that they couldn't watch... The whole Firefly Funhouse thing because it's scaring their children. Good. Good. That means whatever Bray Wyatt is doing is supposed to be on its way to working. Or it is working. That's exactly what he set out to do. Scare your children. Now it's up to you to let them watch the show. Now that you know what's coming. Now you know not to let them watch when Bray Wyatt is on. There you go. It's not that difficult of a parenting decision to do. Simple. Welcome to Tuesday Night Promo Package Live. SmackDown was terrible. God-awful show. The most boring show I think I've ever seen from SmackDown Live. The War Raiders, the team of Hanson and Rowe, relinquished the Tag Team Championships. It's been confirmed. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. And Roman Reigns is up for an MTV Movie and TV Award. Alexa Bliss was pulled from Money in the Bank. We go over all that in a fiery episode of Off the Script Extra. Make sure you guys go and check all that stuff out live on the channel right now. Annotation is linked in the top right corner of the screen. Harry's. Oh, my God, man. Why Harry's? Why is Vince McMahon such a senile old man who doesn't listen to anything creatively from the 37 writers that he employs and pays? Why do I shave with Harry's, man? Because Harry's is the only shave that gives me the closeness that I need. It's smooth. The glide of the blade on my sensitive skin feels fantastic. This is why I use Harry's, and I want you guys to know that you could feel the same way that I do by claiming your trial offer today. Harry's.com slash script. Join the 10 million that have tried Harry's, including myself. Harry's founders were tired of paying for razors that were overpriced, Overdesigned. A lot of these other places, these companies use gimmicks to raise the prices for these products, and they've been doing it for decades. Harry's fixed all that. Simple, clean design, quality, durable blades at a fair price. They bought a world-class blade factory in Germany that's been making quality blades for over 95 years. They've received over 20,000, 20,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google alone. Harry's replacement cartridges are just $2 each. That's half the price of a Gillette Fusion Pro Shield. 
And all Harry's blades come with a 100% quality guarantee. If you don't love Harry's shave, let them know, and they're going to give you a full refund. $13 value trial set. This is what you're going to get. A razor handle. Choice of color is yours. You got a choice of the orange, the evergreen, or the navy blue. Five blade razor with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade. Rich lathering shave gel. It soothes. It hydrates. It smells fantastic. And I'm taking it to Vegas with me. And it comes with a travel blade cover. As I go to Vegas, I'll be shaving at Caesars, getting ready for StarCast. It looks great. You could take it with you. It protects the blade. Or if you're at home, if you're at home, it's a great look on your bathroom sink, man. With all your Harry's products spread out on the bathroom sink like I do, it's great. It looks great. It makes a great conversation piece. It's all around great, man. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash script. Make sure you guys go to harrys.com slash script. Redeem your offer and let them know that I sent you to help support Off The Script. Literally, as I'm recording the podcast this afternoon, I see reports that are confirming Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship at WWE Super Showdown in Saudi Arabia. So I guess the Seth Rollins and AJ Styles match doesn't matter. Yeah, another thing we can add to the list of things that the Saudi shows ruin. Who gives a shit about Styles and Seth Rollins now at Money in the Bank for the Universal Championship when we all know Seth Rollins is planned to defend the title against Brock Lesnar? Unless AJ goes heel and we get some sort of fucking disqualification and it picks up at Extreme Rules. I don't know. But apparently, on top of that, the Super Showdown card has possibly been revealed. Advertising possibly reveals the complete Super Showdown card. Now, there are images floating around that have been sent to various websites. The graphic is supposedly featuring matches that should be expected for Super Showdown, but the card, clearly, as you guys know, could change on a day-to-day basis. If the gra- graphic that is floating around is real and not altered or fan-made, uh, the event in Jeddah on the, what was it, 7th? I believe it's the 7th. June 7th will be actually a pretty packed show. I don't think I'm going to be completely invested in it, but it, it looks pretty decent. It actually looks better than WrestleMania, if you ask me. The card that is floating around right now is the following. Undertaker versus Goldberg. We all know about that. I'll touch on that in a second. Triple H versus Randy Orton confirmed. Maybe he'll tear the other peck. Fucking ridiculous, man. Does he really need to be on these shows? Does he really need to be on these shows? Now, you know why they didn't want to have the TakeOver show following this show. Because we all knew Triple H was going to be part of the show in some way, shape, or form. And here he is wrestling Randy Orton. He wrestled Batista, so they figured, well, why not? Let's let's do Randy Orton and Triple H, so he'll take out all of Evolution. Fucking stupid. 50-man battle royal confirmed. Oh, I guess it's not the greatest Royal Rumble this year, huh? I think they did away with that. Thank God. There's only one Royal Rumble in the year, and it's in January. We don't need two Royal Rumbles. There's one Royal Rumble. And that Royal Rumble is to determine who goes to WrestleMania. The greatest Royal Rumble, what came of that when Braun Strowman won it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. A trophy that he ended up fucking destroying recklessly on Monday Night Raw. Speaking of Strowman, Strowman versus Drew McIntyre at Jeddah Super Showdown. It's going to be a good opportunity for Drew McIntyre to beat Braun Strowman. I would like to see that. Claymore kick right to the face. There you go. A nice little staple on Drew McIntyre's push. Roman Reigns versus Shane McMahon. That's my bathroom break. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Who cares? So look look at this. Shane McMahon, Triple H, Randy Orton, The Undertaker, and Bill Goldberg. Yes, I know the Saudi prince wants all the big names. But Shane McMahon is booked on WWE television more than Brock Lesnar. How, How fucking ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that? Finn Balor versus Andrade for the IC title. That could be a great opportunity for Andrade to win the Intercontinental Championship. So by the looks of it, not only is Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar going to ruin the Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles match. So what this means to me 
is that Finn Balor or Andrade possibly are not winning Money in the Bank because why would he win Money in the Bank and then go on and win the IC title? That seems to be the natural progression for Andrade Cien Almas. I would like Andrade to win the Money in the Bank and say, fuck the Intercontinental Championship, but being that he can't speak English, I guess it's one step at a time. Maybe Vince gives him the IC title because it's a mid-card title, and then when he learns English, maybe he'll get the WWE Championship opportunity. He doesn't necessarily need the briefcase to be the WWE Champion. So we're, we're looking at a possible Ricochet or Mustafa Ali to win the briefcase. It could be, it could be Drew McIntyre. It could be Drew McIntyre. Maybe Sami Zayn wins it. Who the fuck knows? Who knows? But Balor and Andrade, the one match I will be looking forward to in Jeddah on June 7th. Kofi Kingston versus Kevin Owens for the WWE Championship. Boring. Boring. They really haven't sold me on what they're doing now. I doubt they're going to get me interested then. So, depending on what we see, Kofi could beat Kevin Owens by some cheap way at Money in the Bank, and Owens could take the title here. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Rollins versus Lesnar, Universal title match. I would not be shocked if Lesnar is the WWE Universal Champion once again. Daniel Bryan is not featured anywhere on this card. He didn't want to go to Saudi Arabia last time for moral reasons, and the company did not zing him for it. They didn't punish him in any way, so he is apparently not making the trip again this year, so good on him. I don't think they really need him out there anyway. Let him rest and let him do what he's got to do. This seems like a stacked show. It's going to be a newsworthy show. It's just there's not much there that I really give a shit about. Lesnar and Rollins, we've seen it already. How much can they possibly do after what we've seen for four minutes at WrestleMania? Rollins is the Universal Champion, but I would not be surprised if WWE takes the title off of him and puts it on Brock Lesnar because of the Fox deal. So WWE could be reverting right back to where they were with Brock Lesnar. And who the fuck knows what is going on with Brock Lesnar and his deal? Kofi Kingston and Kevin Owens, I'm not interested in. Balor and Andrade, probably match it tonight. Reigns and McMahon, uh, I'll be sleeping through that. Drew McIntyre and Braun Strowman, I don't really give a shit. Triple H and Randy Orton, who gives a shit? Undertaker and Goldberg, the entrances are going to be longer than the actual match. I don't give a shit. 50-man battle royal should be fun. Maybe it's in the same vein of the Royal Rumble, but they're not calling it a Royal Rumble. Maybe there's time intervals, and every minute and a half someone comes down. I don't know. These Saudi shows are nothing but a fucking waste of time. Uh, it's like none of this factors. Half of the show is not even storyline-driven. It's just happening because the Saudi prince wants all the big names on the show. I don't care either way, man. That's the possible card. I could see that being the possible card. And logically, I could see things falling into place quite nicely there. Goldberg and The Undertaker announced for Super Showdown in Saudi Arabia. Meltzer discussed this upcoming match on the Wrestling Observer Radio. He said that the match WWE booked for Saudi uh, would go over much better in the United States. However, this is not the world we live in. Goldberg, I'm, making, or I'm sure, is making $2 million to go out there and do the deed for The Undertaker. Therefore... It's probably best to keep this match very short as the two legends battle in Saudi Arabia. He says, and I quote, the one thing with Undertaker and Bill Goldberg is that you're pretty much telling the people that they're probably going to get a three-minute match and it's probably for the best that they do. So for Undertaker, God knows, I can see why he would come back for that. You know what I mean? It's probably uh, not that bad. I guess it's too bad that it's not in the United States. It'll work in Saudi Arabia too, but if it was in the United States, that aura would carry through there are three minutes to four minutes easily, and it would end up being good. Now, with everybody sitting in the first fucking 15 rows who are uh, who are doing this, and and the actions over there, they're, they're all they're over there talking on their phone. That's all, that's all you're gonna see in Jeddah. Goldberg actually posted a picture on social media of the two wrestling legends. It was on Instagram, and he included a very telling caption. He says that it would be a difficult decision to finally, or it was a difficult decision to finally accept the stream and that he explained that how time was certainly a factor in this difficult decision uh, of making the choice to take the dead man on in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I'm sure it was such a difficult decision, man. They opened up their checkbook. Uh, Bill, you want two million? Uh, here you go. You do a three-minute match with The Undertaker and uh, we'll pay you two million and then you go home and do what you gotta do. Yeah, such a difficult fucking decision. The most difficult thing about Goldberg taking this match is the fucking flight over there. Which I'm sure is first class, and they're, they're going to treat him like royalty. Yeah, such a terrible decision. Such a difficult decision. 
Undertaker's probably making a cool two million for this as well. There's a reason why he didn't show up at WrestleMania, because he's saving himself for three minutes for Bill Goldberg. Now, many contributing factors making it an extremely difficult decision for me to accept this match. A match against The Undertaker would have been a dream 10 to 15 years ago, says Goldberg, but it never happened. We can't change the past, but somehow the stars have aligned, and though it uh, be a bit later than I desire, this matchup is still a dream for me. I have nothing but respect for Taker. He is a legend, but now I have to do what I have to do, prep for war one more time. This is a guy that came out of, he retired, came out of retirement for Brock Lesnar to watch... Uh, you know, the WWE Universal Championship title picture go up in fucking flames while his son watched, actually able to get him to see his father wrestle, which was the best thing about it all. It didn't do anything for the Universal Championship. You buried Kevin Owens in the process. They gave you an entertaining match at WrestleMania with Brock Lesnar. Six minutes of two fucking bulls beating the shit out of each other. Probably the best thing on that entire show. But he came out of retirement for that, retired again, and now he's coming out of retirement for what? Oh, it's a dream to wrestle The Undertaker, right? No, no, it's a dream to make $2 million for three minutes of work. Like I said, the toughest thing that Goldberg has to do is take the 18-hour flight over there, whatever the fuck it is, 14 hours? Give me a break. Give me a break. Pay me $2 million, I'll make the fucking flight out there too and take a spear from Bill Goldberg. Fuck out of here, man. Triple H is also competing on the card because he's fucking Triple H. That's the one thing I do not like about Triple H. Does he need to be in the ring? He tore his peck last time he was in Jeddah for Crown Jewel during that awful Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Kane, Undertaker match. Is he going to tear the other peck this time? At least this time, he'll have enough time to definitely recuperate before next year's WrestleMania. WWE's official release for Super Showdown, which was rumored to be named Sands of Time, Triple H versus Randy Orton was confirmed. The former Evolution members know each other very well and have battled many times before. It's all I want to see, another fucking match between Triple H and Randy Orton. Because I'm sure it's going to be a lot better than what we've seen with Batista. Randy Orton moves just like Batista. Younger than Batista, but it's a very slow, methodical pace. It's going to be a good match for the old school heads. Probably a good story there, there's a lot of history there, but I don't give a fuck. The fuck does Triple H and Randy Orton have to do with one another now? How are you going to build that story? That's going to be the most interesting part of this all. How are you going to build a story between those two guys? They haven't even been in the same ring together outside of the reunion at SmackDown 1000. Like, what does Randy Orton have to do with Triple H now? After all these years. <laughs> so fucking stupid. WWE also announced that there's a 50-man battle royal, which will be the biggest in company history. Really? Didn't they have the greatest Royal Rumble, which was 50 men last year? So now this year's the biggest of all time. Well, what was last year's? That you renamed the greatest Royal Rumble. And this year's one don't even have a fucking name. No, but it's the biggest of all time though, right? Some unknown battle royal. What a way to shit on the Royal Rumble name, huh? Yeah, well, the greatest Royal Rumble was the biggest Royal Rumble or biggest battle royal, Royal Rumble, whatever the fuck you want to, of all time. Now, an unknown, unnamed battle royal is bigger than what we did last year that actually had a legit name. What a way to shit all over the fucking Royal Rumble name, huh? Anyway, Brock Lesnar and Seth Rollins. Let's go back to that. Rollins is defending the title, I presume, against Brock Lesnar. No reason why Brock Lesnar's going out there. Like I mentioned this before. Who are you going to put Brock Lesnar against? It's either going to be Bill Goldberg, but the WWE opted to do Goldberg and The Undertaker. If Brock Lesnar doesn't have Goldberg as an opponent, The Undertaker? Nobody wants to see that again. Or Rollins. And Lesnar's not going out there to fight Rollins for nothing. It's got to be for the Universal title. And why wouldn't they give Lesnar the title? Being that he's flying out there already, you're going to pay him all this money to go out there? He don't need to be out there. He's only out there for the fucking money. Put the cherry on top of the fucking cake for this and give him the Universal Championship. Why not? Why not? People want to attribute the failing ratings to Rollins being the champion, which I, I don't understand those people. The ratings were in the tank before Rollins even took the Universal Championship. So who the fuck are you to blame Rollins or Becky Lynch for the championship or for the ratings being that they're champions? I don't get it. I don't get it. Now, Brad Shepard reports that Lesnar will work the Saudi show on June 7th and the company is assuming that SummerSlam will happen as well. However, nothing is clear because there are zero confirmed dates for Lesnar at this point past the Super Showdown in Jeddah. According to a source in WWE, Brock Lesnar will do his spot at the Saudi show and probably at SummerSlam. 
Although that part isn't clear because internally there are zero confirmed dates for Brock Lesnar after the Saudi show. This is what Brad Shepard said. Lesnar historically likes to sign shorter deals because he negotiates new contracts while playing two or more sides against each other for his services. Now he doesn't have UFC. He retired from UFC. They are not giving him the money that he desired. So now he is all WWE. And only time will tell what Brock Lesnar's next move will be. But he doesn't have that leverage in UFC anymore. He could potentially use AEW as leverage, but I don't see him doing that, being that WWE probably scooped him up and signed him to a new deal. And we all know that Lesnar's future always remains uncertain. He's the one guy in, in this company that when he signs a new deal, it, it is like a, 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 it's like sealed in a fucking vault somewhere. You, you don't know. The only, per- the only people that know are Vince and Paul Heyman. And maybe Triple H. That's about it. And, and they, <laughs> you know, that's all. Those, those are the only people that know. So if it's the same as all the other years he's been, why would it be any different this year? We're not going to know. We're not going to know. The guy could show up whenever he wants. The guy's probably going to win the Universal title in, in Jeddah. He lost at WrestleMania. You're going to have him lose again? I don't see Brock Lesnar losing to Seth Rollins twice. There's a reason why they're booking this as a title match. And I hope that they don't go back to the same rinse and repeat over and over again. We need a champion on Monday Night Raw. Unless Lesnar is going to be on every fucking show as the champion, I don't want it. I don't want it. Who's Lesnar going to fight at SummerSlam? Is there anybody else left that you legitimately give a shit about? Maybe a Bobby Lashley? Maybe? Bobby Lashley was rumored to fight Goldberg and Jetta. I don't think Bobby Lashley is going to do much of anything. Maybe a match with Lesnar is exactly what he needs. I don't know. But I don't know what Lesnar's going to do at SummerSlam. There really isn't anything left for him to do. He's beaten everybody. He's wrestled everybody that you could imagine. They fed him to Reigns. What else is there to do? Lashley is the only one. Matt Riddle? Possibly WrestleMania? I don't see Matt Riddle being called up anytime soon. I don't know, man. Lesnar's future is uncertain because WWE wants it to be uncertain. Every time the man signs on the dotted line, you never hear a fucking word about how long he signed for, for how much, when he's going to show up. Who cares? I really don't give a fuck. Someone who we know is on Monday Night Raw, and someone who I wish we would see less of, especially in the main event, is Baron Corbin. Now, Baron Corbin is on Raw, and he's gotten some significant victories over Kurt Angle and Ricochet. In the last couple of weeks. He's all over the fucking place. He's in Money in the Bank. Dave Meltzer uh, briefly addressed the company's reasoning for giving Baron Corbin a push on Wrestling Observer Radio. Baron Corbin is primed to take on a much bigger challenge in the coming months. They are building Corbin up for Seth Rollins, so he had to win the match against Ricochet. This is your Extreme Rules main event, folks. Penciled in right now. Rollins versus Baron Corbin. So if you're flying out or have tickets to Extreme Rules, sell them. If you are planning to watch it on the WWE Network, don't. Just watch me. I'll fill you in. I'll fill you in. The match is being promoted already via advertisements for the WWE Universal Championship. Now, clearly things can change. Rollins might not even be the fucking champion going into the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Rollins is right now set for Corbin. It's unknown who Rollins will be facing at Stomping Ground. I don't don't even think people should be talking about the Stomping Ground pay-per-view because we don't even know if he's going to be champion going into the Stomping Ground pay-per-view. Looks like WWE is at least right now looking to build up Corbin as a credible threat so that he can make a run at the Universal title this summer. Man, those ratings. Jesus fucking Christ. You think the ratings are in the toilet now? Give Baron Corbin the Universal Championship on Monday Night Raw. Make that the main program you see on Monday Night Raw. You thought ratings were bad a couple of weeks ago? You see nothing yet. The one thing that we don't need more of is Baron Corbin in the fucking main event. With his fucking vest. I don't know whether he's serving me a fucking cocktail or doing a wrestling maneuver. Shaken, not stirred, asshole! I asked for a Manhattan! Spoilers for Extreme Rules. Wells Fargo Center. What is that, Philly? The Wells Fargo Center? My God. I can't wait for Extreme Rules. Seth Rollins versus Baron Corbin for the Universal title. Other matches are now being promoted. 
Kofi Kingston versus Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton, apparently, in a triple threat match. They're also advertising a handicap match of Roman Reigns versus McMahon and Elias. So fans shouldn't expect Reigns' rivalry with McMahon and Elias to end anytime soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dave. According to the report, July is also advertising Styles versus Drew McIntyre for the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. That could be a good match, being that they're two Impact alum. It is also important to remember that the card is also subject to change, so everything that I'm saying could possibly not even be a thing uh, weeks from now. So, there you go. Extreme Rules, Stomping Grounds, man. We, we are in for a long summer, man. Take your vacations, go to the beach, have a cold one for me, go to the beach bar, put your feet in the sand, sit out by the pool, listen to Off the Script. This is what you need to be doing, man. Apparently, WWE TV is not what we need during the summer. Hopefully, it gets a lot better with AEW coming into the picture with Fight for the Fallen, and then they got All In 2 in August in Chicago, right in the middle of the summer, man. Gonna be good. I'll be out in Chicago as well. Uh, visiting you guys. Then I'll have a formal meet and greet because I had a great time at Buffalo Wild Wings last year, man. We might do the same thing again if it's at the Sears Center. Finally, guys, I'm getting the fuck out of here because I've been here for two hours and you guys got more in this podcast than I think I've done in many, many weeks. John Cena. John Cena. Says WWE doesn't need him anymore. Yeah, l- l- let's ask Vince McMahon that. Yo, 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 Vince, do you need me? Do you need John Cena? Oh, I need, uh, I need my Babe Ruth. The Babe Ruth of WWE. I need you to come back. I gotta put you in a feud with Elias. That's gonna be a ratings hit. Fox is gonna love that. That'll, that'll generate four ratings. John Cena versus Elias. Yeah. And then we'll put you against Roman Reigns again, just like we did at uh, at No Mercy. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again. And we'll have him go over you again because we need John Cena back on TV. You gotta put Roman Reigns over because the last five years have uh, have been so stupid, the fans don't understand. John Cena doesn't need the WWE anymore. WWE doesn't need John Cena. Please. Please. John Cena was interviewed by The Rap. And these are the same people that actually announced the AEW TV deal well ahead of what we heard this week at the Turner advertising function that that they had going on where everybody, you know, gathered together and they announced TNT, AEW partnership. Now, over the last few years, Cena has taken a big step back from WWE. He's put a lot of efforts into his acting career. Good. Good. John Cena did it right. He did it right. Former WWE champion also understands and admitted that WWE doesn't need him right now. He had to take a step back in order to realize that. He says, and I quote, The WWE does not need me. I need it. And I love it. And I love every minute of it. Every time I'm associated with it. But I felt... It was the first time this year at WrestleMania I took a step back and looked at everything and realized it's such a powerful machine. End quote. Cena then brought up about being a coach is something that he'd like to do uh, at the Performance Center. He lives in Tampa and he can't keep up with the speed of the matches. Cena made it clear that he doesn't have the mindset that he can work like he did a decade ago, but at this time he's sure uh, when it's the right time for him to go and move on from wrestling, that he'd like to give his brain to uh, the students down at the PC. I'd go down to the Performance Center often and speak to the students. I live in Tampa, which is close to Orlando. I'm not saying I'm doing this and leaving you guys behind. I'm having a talk with the man in the mirror and saying, I might be a step slower than where I was, and I'm not sure if it's right for me to go on. You always want to walk away at the right time and never want the courtesy clap from the audience. I'm not sick of it. I am just trying to have a realistic conversation that not many people in sports entertainment have. Uh, They want to hold on to the flame as long as they can, Cena said. I would much rather leave a lasting impression for what I did than trying to milk the system for selfish gain. Now, you know, it's very difficult to believe anybody in in the landscape of of wrestling when they say shit like this. Sean lived everything that John Cena said here, and he came back for what? He came back for what? You don't know, uh, as far as a fan, what that did. And I know I don't feel, you know, like everybody else who is, oh my God, watching Shawn Michaels is like a, is like me living, re- me reliving my childhood. No. A lot of people felt the way I did. I don't want to see Shawn Michaels in a match where I know it's forced, it's not natural, 
And I don't want to see him do something that he's merely doing for a paycheck. Like, if we got The Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25 to close out, which was left open, really, if you want to think about it, WWE could have easily booked a storyline and built a storyline from what happened at the end of WrestleMania 26. If they did that, I would be more invested in that. Knowing that they got Kane and The Undertaker and Triple H and Shawn Michaels involved, it, it was just a gathering of fucking aging legends for the sake of money. That's all it was. I didn't want to see Shawn Michaels in that match, even though he did outperform everybody. The Undertaker is doing what John Cena doesn't want to do. Undertaker could have left a lasting impression. Here he is at 52 years old, wrestling Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. Instead, Undertaker is milking the system for selfish gain. I hope John Cena lives up to his word. We don't need to see John Cena every single major pay-per-view, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series. I, I do expect to see him on SmackDown Live when they move to Fox in October. I do expect him to see some in-ring time in WWE here and there. Use him when it's important. Use him when it's necessary. You know? The Rock has not been seen since when? WrestleMania 31, right? The Rock is, is one of the most sought-after guys that the WWE wants to have back for a, a, another run. A run with the world title to put over Roman Reigns, which I do expect to see happen eventually. You know? But John Cena has done all that. What else is there for John Cena to do? Maybe put over a guy here and there. I would love to see John Cena come back and put over a Velveteen Dream. Because it's been on social media. It's been there. John Cena and Velveteen Dream, you got a story there. John Cena is the fucking end-all, be-all in WWE. He's the Babe Ruth, apparently, to Vince McMahon of WWE. How great would that be to see John Cena come back for guys like that, knowing that he's in the position that he's in to put Dream over? Do you know what a win over John Cena on a major stage, on a major main roster pay-per-view, what that would do for Velveteen Dream? Seeing him fly through the air, drop the fucking purple Rainmaker elbow drop on John Cena? Pinning him one, two, three? You're a made man after that. That's what you need John Cena to do. I think John Cena would come back and work that style of match with the Velveteen Dream. Velveteen Dream is not flashy. He's very methodical in his pacing. He's not high-flying. He can be. He's very athletic, but he's not going to be out there working to a speed that John Cena can't work. I would like to see that. EC3 is another one. EC3 and John Cena, they've teased matches on social media. You know? There are still things for John Cena to do if he wants to do them, if WWE is creative enough to get John Cena back in those roles. I don't think he's done completely, but he's doing everything the right way. I respect. I, I've gained more respect for John Cena now in his older years than I did when I was watching him doing the fucking all this other shit, right? He was he was pretty much what Roman Reigns is now. And I've grown to appreciate who John Cena is and what he represents. He said all the right things here. I hope he lives up to his word. I really do. I do want to see Cena back because I think he's the type of guy that's been away and when he comes back, he does have that type of impact. And it's sad that when The Undertaker comes back, I don't feel that again. I don't feel that with The Undertaker. When The Undertaker came back on Monday Night Raw, everybody was flipping out. Everybody's going crazy. Oh, he tombstoned and chokeslam a lie. Who gives a shit? He wasn't at WrestleMania. I didn't give a fuck. I didn't miss him at all. A couple of years ago, I'm like, how is WWE going to have a WrestleMania without The Undertaker? This year? Didn't bother me one bit. Didn't bother me one, one bit. You know, want to know why? Because I know he's old. And after the recent performances that I seen, I had no desire to see The Undertaker in a ring. So when he showed up on the Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania to build towards what was supposed to be a match with Elias, it was just him doing that. How many times can you see that before you start getting bored of it? It's not important anymore. It's not exciting anymore. It's just there for the fucking idiots, the brain-dead idiots. Oh, look, it's The Undertaker. I don't give a fuck. John Cena is more valuable to the WWE than The Undertaker is right now. Because John Cena still has a lot left to give where The Undertaker has nothing. Undertaker is merely doing this to fucking sign the paychecks and put the closing chapter on this book that he's written for 30 years. That's it. John Cena still has value. The Undertaker's value went out the window with the fucking streak. Done. Done. 
Everything that that shriek represented, when that match was over, Undertaker should have... That, that was it. That was it. Done. I didn't care or want to see The Undertaker ever again. Now, I did just say that I would love to see another Shawn Michaels-Undertaker match, but clearly they're not doing that, and Shawn doesn't want to come back. And that book uh, is over, and, and that ship has sailed. Done. John Cena has more value than The Undertaker does, and I would like to see John Cena put over the younger guys in WWE when the time is right. He still has a lot left to give, and he's doing everything right. And I'm, I'm actually proud that he's doing everything the right way. He didn't need wrestling anymore. Why break your body down and fucking put yourself in a position to where you're not going to live comfortably when you're 60, 70 years old? You want to see him into his 60s, 70s, 80s and live a, a fruitful fucking life. You know, and be, and be healthy at that age. You can't knock the guy for what he's doing. You can't. You got to respect him, man. I'm getting out of here. Thank you guys so very much, man. Big, big show today, and it's going to be even bigger tomorrow, man. We're going to go over everything All Elite Wrestling, the TV deal, what they signed as far as TNT goes, and all the inner workings of the deal, my opinion on the price of Double or Nothing. We're going to go over that. Plus, John Moxley, Jack Swagger, Mr. Ja uh, Jake Hager. Might have let the cat out of the bag about John Moxley being at Double or Nothing, man. We're going to go over all of it. We're going to go over everything. All Elite Wrestling on Off The Script tomorrow. So don't go anywhere, man. Please make sure you guys follow me on social media. Very important in the coming week with me going to Vegas, man. JD from NY206 on both Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Make sure you guys check out all the other videos that you might have missed. Raw, SmackDown, NXT, Off The Script, Extra, all this week. Link is in the top right corner in that little annotation. The I, drop it down. Everything you need is right there. Make sure you guys check out Harry's, harrys.com slash script. And I will be back tomorrow, as always, for part two of Off the Script, man. Thank you guys so very much. Until then, hit that thumbs up. Take care. Have a great Friday. And I'll see you right back here for All Elite Wrestling right here on Off the Script. I'll see you then.